Welcome back to the Empower Podcast. My name is Blaine and today myself and Glenn will be co-hosts of today's show. And on this episode, we're excited to share today's very special guests, Professor Batange Ndemo, uh, a global technocrat, currently serving as Kenya's ambassador to Belgium and previously was the permanent secretary of Kenya's Ministry of Information and Communication. So Prof, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So um, today's episode, obviously, considering your your background in the space, I'd love to talk about technology and blockchain uh, and the role that they can play in Africa, not only today but also looking into the future. Um, but to start us off, can you please tell the podcast uh, maybe a little bit about about your background, uh, your journey? and some of the work that you are doing at, at the moment. Well, thank you for the invitation. I have, um, in the past, I've been teaching at the University of Nairobi um, at the Faculty of Business and Management Science. And uh, at some point, the government of Kenya appointed me as permanent secretary for communication uh, where I was for about nine years. I left, went back to university, and again, now the government has requested me to, to come to Belgium as ambassador to Belgium and the EU mission. Mm. Lovely. Um, maybe to, to start us off with our first blockchain-related question, um, what are your current thoughts on blockchain as this emerging technology and um, do you think blockchain is a, a genuine tool um, for you know positive fundamental change or do you think that has the potential to to have that yes i've said several times that uh, this is a technology that is much more important for developing countries because there are many applications that uh, could transform uh, the developing world. Um, some of the, besides um, the financial as aspects, um, it can also be used effectively to streamline like supply chains in the agricultural sector, uh, be able to bring a little more transparency, which is sometimes not there in developing countries. And uh, from the financial side, uh, I think if we put our act together, Africa's resources could eventually uh, be a positive contributor to development. I'm talking about this, if you look at the coltan, copal, um, as people begin to move to electric vehicles, much of those resources are found in Africa. And I think if we manage them properly by developing NFTs, uh, we could raise resources to change the lives of people. Uh, but it has taken too long to explain to policymakers uh, that we can begin uh, to create um, resources for development uh, leveraging the the reserves of the of some of the uh, minerals that Africa has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe on the you mentioned the transparency part of blockchain. That's obviously a property that many people associate with blockchain, along with maybe immutability, decentralization. Um, do you think these properties? Uh, are essential to solve specific problems that exist in Africa? Like, for example, can some of these problems be, you know, require blockchain as part of the solution? Indeed, they would. Um, I, a lot of farmers actually don't get to recognize the assets they have until um, almost a year down the road. I mean, I can give you an example for coffee growers, tea growers. Uh, once they deliver these uh, studies, or only recognize that as an asset 
after they have sold. Um, it doesn't have to take that long for them to benefit pay school fees for their children. Um, they could um, earn tokens, which can be discounted anywhere because that's an asset which is never recognized um, until um, kids are chased out of school. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe on to some of the, so blockchain as a, a tool for, for change, uh, what, what are some other use cases, maybe short term? I know obviously in power, we're you know, exploring one use case. What are some other use cases that you see short term, but also maybe long term um, in Africa, blockchain use cases in Africa? We talked briefly about decentralized financing, uh, finance. Um, Africa's economic fortunes can change very drastically. I mean, you could transform the SME sector if you begin to leverage decentralized finance, uh, because it's very easy now to, uh, you could easily put together um, MSMEs across the continent and be able to mobilize resources uh, to be able to find them. This is what has been the biggest problem and completely change the picture of uh, economic development in the entire continent. Mm. I think one big thing about this is the uh, the inclusive uh, nature of blockchain or, or more that blockchain can en enable this inclusivity and the increase in accessibility. Um, what industries is that needed the most? Um, obviously, fi the financial sector is probably uh, the obvious one, um, which then links to pretty much everything else. But Look at every economy, yeah. every economy in Africa, um, 60, actually 6 to 70% of the GDP comes from agriculture has not been fully exploited. If you look at the, uh, from farm to fork, uh, we lose up to 40%. We don't have to lose that much uh, in order to create food security. So you are not just providing the resources, but you are streamlining the supply chain and also take those poor farmers from what they have been uh, to bring them into global value chains. What about you, Glenn? The inclusive part is you know, a big part of your philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Prof, you mentioned there before around the um, around policy, and it's it's one of the challenges of of inclusivity and decentralization that we have with with I think particularly in developing countries where the level of of policy and political control on the one side versus the decentralization um, and empowerment of the individual on the other. And they almost, they seem almost as conflicting. Um, and obviously you're, you're in an advisory position in terms of that and, and working hard in terms of allowing the power of the, of the individual to be liberated, which I think is one of the key aspects of, of this technology is, is enabling people on the ground to be liberated, to be able to start building their own futures without a level of centralized control, without individuals making decisions for them. You know, often those individuals don't have the capacity or no knowledge on the ground, or, you know, of what that person on the ground is really experiencing. So that sort of, how do you, how are you balancing that in terms of policy, um, it, you know, in your discussions with the, with the politicians? Well, it's, it, we would start from what they can agree with. Uh, of course, when they begin to see that their wealth is threatened, I mean, those who have microfinance institutions that have played a role in funding uh, small enterprises, if they begin to find that uh, the whole sector has been decentralized and uh, you are creating assets from what never used to be assets, uh, into funding people, putting money into the pockets of people, 
they would begin to oppose, of course, and they have a much bigger voice uh, with policymakers. And that's why I say you need policymakers who are willing to take risk for the sake of creating greater inclusivity for, for those who have suffered most. Uh, of course, there is going to be a fight uh, from established institutions. I've gone through that before. Um, the, when we brought forth uh, M-Pesa, uh, the, bank, the banking sector fought it fiercely uh, without actually knowing the impact of uh, mobile money. Uh, today, they work comfortably uh, alongside it, and they have been using the product. So it's unfortunate that we fight even before we understand uh, the greater, greater users. But what they look at it now is that they are going to lose power. The central bank would have too much power of them. So these are the things that we must begin to, to assure. One thing you mentioned was the kind of the first step is finding something to agree on. Um, what would that common ground be? And, and who... Who are the parties? So you the so I can wrap my head around it because I'm I'm not too sure of the process. But are you referring to kind of the governments and like the entrepreneurs or the other? Who are we finding common ground between? There are several areas of common ground where, um, for example, what Empower is doing in Mozambique. Uh, no one has been able to do low income housing. Uh, that is affordable to citizens. And uh, you don't find big banks or medium banks playing in that space. They would think that's a child's play. They can do what they want to do. But after some time, you would begin to see muscle in these new forms of financing, and they can begin to grow. Those are areas where they, could, they cannot oppose because they think they are outside of that space. Uh, micro enterprises, they have been avoiding them because they did, don't quite understand, they don't have the records, they don't have uh, the collateral to, to borrow from the banks. Uh, so the more we begin to use artificial intelligence in, in giving credit um, based on, uh, on, on character, uh, which some of the banks are beginning to think that if someone can build this, we can take advantage of it. But I think the way it would go is that once we begin um, to use uh, emerging tech and create new products, uh, they would push them to, to accept spaces they would never have played before. Interesting. I, I think that for me is one of the most exciting things around blockchain technology, personally, Prof, is because the ability to, it's changing thinking. So as you say, the new techs, whether it's AI or blockchain or, or, or M-Pesa, you know, the poster child of mobile money across the world, but it, it's around taking needs that are on the ground that are real in the developing world, in Africa particularly, understanding those needs and trying to design products that meet those needs. So just as you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, for us, we look, we're trying to say, let's not look backwards. Let's not look at historical data. Let's look forwards. Let's try and build, as you say, reputation but based on character, based on, on um, you know, continued payment. Um, build that kind of reputation so that some, we're giving somebody who's, because by definition, Capitalism right now, or the banking system, works on history. You, you know that whole thing is you don't you can borrow money from the bank when you don't need it, but as soon as you do need it, is when you can't borrow it. And it's kind of those kind of rules are if you put that onto the the, the, the mass, you know that sets a continent like Africa back so far because in order to access the funding, the individuals can't do so, the countries can't do so. Um, so for me, that's the exciting part about looking forward and changing thinking is the, is the really interesting part around, around what these techs are doing. It's the human change as well as the technology change that, that, that is exciting. 
Actually, credit score uh, is beginning to be accepted by mainstream banking uh, because they are beginning to feel the pinch from um, those other products that uh, started the process before, um, like mobile money, like uh, mobile lending, which, which is grown so big, predatory groups that started using the same space for um, for um, um, what do you call they borrow to do betting and other gaming and stuff. Um, we would have actually moved further because they began to use betting as an excuse that it's easy money. They are going to use it, and we need to change this. Yeah, absolutely. The question I also wanted to ask you, Prof, is. is uh, also, when I started getting excited around around the new tech and, and particularly the blockchain was around new communities and the ability to create value in communities, as you know, because historically we're so used to borders and nation states being the definition by which we create a currency and or values value that if we can are able to create like minded you know, communities or groupings that are cross-border, cross-nationality, that that's not important, but they have shared interests. So obviously for us, the one we're interested in is, is housing. So, you know, if we can get players who are interested in housing, the geographical boundaries are irrelevant. You know, the, the knowledge of... But Ethiopia has no forex. Uh, but the Ethiopia trades heavily with Kenya. And what the the traders have discovered is that they need uh, staple currencies in form of crypto, which they get from their diaspora, and then they use it to pay for goods uh, which they buy from Kenya. Uh, we have one bank which does uh, fiat. Uh, it's happening. Everybody knows it. Uh, nobody's complaining. Business is booming. Um, I was doing some work for um, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, and I've made those recommendations that we need to see what is happening on the ground, because usually people are ahead of policymakers. They think ahead. They know where they're benefiting from. I think we should not stop. We should not uh, be on their way. Uh, we need to encourage that is why in Kenya we created a sandbox. Uh, if the regulator wants to know more, he can go into the sandbox and see how the whole thing is happening. Nobody has been taken to court the businesses between Ethiopia and the Kenya, which are done using uh, crypto. I, I absolutely concur with you. I think that's the, that's the way that we can support the development is ex exactly see what's happening and support Exactly that. The, the decentralization, the intelligence is at the edges of the of the communities. It's the people at the edges on the ground who understand the issues and, and have self-interest. So all of us, if we can enable that self-interest to flourish and support that, the, the, the process just becomes a natural process, as you say. And, and if we can allow that and step out of the way from a from a policy and a and a um uh, as you say, allow that to happen. Is, is that kind of sandbox element, is, is, is that able to come through at a broader level as well? Or is, or is that a specifically it, Kenyan it, thing? Well, uh, Ethiopia, I think it's closing their eyes because they don't have uh, forex. And uh, at the same time, they need uh, materials for the factories. Uh, so, Everybody is benefiting from, from, from the, the process. Uh, but more important is that uh, those of us who are discussing this must begin to take the discussion forward uh, by taking advantage of the spaces and to see how far we can go. For example, we have been asking our central bank uh, if they can allow uh, stable currencies, for example. Um, uh, people still haven't differentiated between um, cryptocurrencies that are recreated elsewhere, which nobody understands utility, 
and those cryptocurrencies that we can use in business which are stable. Uh, so we actually, I, I normally say, we must move into the stable currency. People become comfortable in that space. And then we can now begin to shift to other areas uh, of investment where uh, there is some utility where you can invest. Mm. Interesting. So the, the, the stable currencies kind of acts as like a gateway into the, the larger crypto ecosystem potentially that's what everybody everybody every everywhere else i've spoken when they want to understand the retail aspect of digital money uh, they're asking us in kenya how has it been uh, what is the impact on the economy what you, you know and what we are talking about is that we have become more efficient than we were before and uh, the losses we see uh, like theft, it's not as large as what they experience in normal banking sector. Yeah. What one interesting stat, um, at least I find interesting, is how young the population is in Africa. So I think I read somewhere, I think roughly around seventy percent of sub-Saharan Africa is under thirty, around that number. Um, but I'm curious, considering that that number. Um, what other opportunities that arise when you combine Africa having a high concentration of young people plus blockchain? What 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 happens when you combine yeah, those things together? I I could I couldn't get you twice, uh, uh, but I think you are talking about the, the the average age of an African, which is around nineteen, uh, which is uh, <laughs> which is a very disruptive age. Uh, they are a little lazier than uh, before, <laughs> so they are easily <laughs> convinced to move into these uh, convenient ways of buying their, what they want to buy. So that is going to influence the change uh, much faster than people think. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the young population uh, will accelerate perhaps the change that blockchain can bring. They would. Yeah. They would. Yeah, I also think that the lack of infrastructure that we've talked about before drives the need for the acceptance of that as well. So and I think that's the exciting thing for Africa, so that we've got young people with real needs that are not being met by the traditional systems, which is, a, in, in my mind, a, a wonderful melting pot for innovation and creativity, which is what we start, you know, we've, I mean, M-Pesa obviously is the, is the poster child of that, but you know, so I can't say we're starting to see it, but I think we're starting to see it flourish a lot more now. You know, I think there's a lot more interest globally in in this in this melting pot and this opportunity. I think there's a lot more interest than historically, where you know we used to talk about Africa and people's eyes used to you know invest into Africa and people's eyes used to glaze over, whereas now there's an, there seems to be a lot more interest, I think, than, than you know, a couple of years back. I don't know. That's my experience. Do, do you find the same? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if you go, um, Nairobi has quite a huge number of young people who work online. Um, actually, they are paid in crypto, uh, and they are very comfortable. They are very comfortable with that because uh, you know that you have your money instantly. I mean, uh, they are going to move this to another level um, that it will be very difficult for governments to to refuse to empower them to use the systems. Yeah, Absolutely. And if we can drive more use cases like that, more growth cases like that, I think, as you say, that that's the, again, because there's the perception so much are still in the world, in the, you know, in the tr traditional space of finders, as soon as we mention crypto, it's you know drug dealers and money launderers, and not the real use cases that we find in in Africa. And for me, that's also it's part of that. It's driving the real use cases and the real benefits of what's happening. And and if we can keep driving that message, as you say, hopefully we can keep keep the policy policies loose and sand sandboxes open. I don't know whether you know. Um... <laughs> Kenya started this before the word crypto. Uh, they they started uh, community 
community currencies. Uh, one is called Bangra Pesa. Uh, it has worked. It has stayed for a very long time. The government arrested the founders. Uh, they couldn't find uh, a legal framework to, 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 to sue them in court. So they released them. They continue working, and it's working perfectly well. Maybe, maybe in terms of, um, I th I've listened to a few of your other interviews, and you've mentioned like a, a roadmap around kind of uh, maybe technology development. When we look at blockchain, what what do you see as being the roadmap to scale blockchain development uh, in Africa, and maybe? In that roadmap, what would some of the challenges be along that journey, perhaps, for mainstream adoption? Now, from the policy side, um, I think the central banks must begin to take uh, CBDCs much more seriously because they, they came up and uh, stepped back. They don't know whether to move. They want to look at other countries. Um, Africa has a different, um, the problems in Africa are different and they require that, those systems. And uh, as we push going forward, we also must begin to, to make sure that the infrastructure is in place. Um, if you look at the, during the, um, the, 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 the pandemic, um, the Kenyan president said, uh, that uh, let's not use cash because it is uh, helping to spread COVID. 98% uh, of the population was using uh, mobile money. Uh, and Tanzania, the same, more people are using that. Uh, slowly, we are beginning to see um, Africa finding um, use of these mobile or digital platforms uh, improving. In fact, even economists are getting confused whether some countries will develop because of, uh, of digitization or they would wait to go through the normal path of uh, ag agri to industrial to service sector. Um, but you are going to see greater and greater efficiencies coming from leveraging uh, emerging tech. And those that would play a major role would include blockchain. Why? Because uh, I talked about the value chains, um, which are broken, which we need to fix. And the only way to fix is to leverage those technologies. And I'm very happy that you find many young people now are talking about blockchain use. Um, uh, and even government host, government uh, government is beginning also to to use it in some ways uh, distribution of medicines um, so uh, the use cases are growing uh, there was a misunderstanding from the beginning um, the financial sector has become more accommodating uh, some of us must move with new products like housing, like what is happening in Mozambique, um, and soon it would be acceptable. We've been talking about you know, young people and new ideas. For any aspiring developers or entrepreneurs that are listening in Africa, do you have any tips or advice for, for, for those sorts of people who are... Um, looking to use emerging technologies like blockchain to build a business or anything along those lines? I actually say any of the problems that you solve uh, is a lot of money. Uh, some of these problems cannot be found in the Western world. So people who are waiting to see the innovations come from the Western world to Africa are completely mistaken. We must be able to get our goods and products into market in Africa, uh, where there is no infrastructure, where there is, you know, we are beginning to see that some of those can be solved. If you see the number of apps 
which uses uh, blockchain that are in agriculture sector. Agriculture is very big in Africa. Um, we need to leverage big data uh, to be able to develop uh, systems that understand where demand and supply uh, is most needed. Once, once they understand this and they begin to develop apps, uh, you are looking for wheat, for example, wheat flour, uh, and you know it's available somewhere. There are logistics farms which can drop this. Uh, that's, these are simple problems, but eventually they will be very big. So I say blockchain was created for Africa to move Africa from where we are to a new space that uh, we would begin to see. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of the podcast. Um, there is a closing question I, I want to ask, but Glenn, do you, did you have any questions you wanted uh, to ask that we haven't covered? No, I think that's a brilliant summary. Thank you. I, that that line there is just, just it's exactly that. I, it, it's, for me, the exciting part of really understanding that as I started to really understand the potential that it had for transformation, that was the exciting part for me was was the, the you know really getting into that and, and understanding that and realizing exactly what you just said it it's ex, it encapsulates mm -hmm. exactly that we're not going to find problems if not us then who is the question i keep asking it, it, we've mm -hmm. got to solve those problems we've got to find the ways of solving them and we've got to address them in ways that make it work for africa prof uh for those that are listening and want to connect with you learn more about your work, uh, where can they reach you or like, where can they connect with you online? I'm all over. Everywhere. <laughs> from, from, <laughs> from Twitter to LinkedIn to ev everywhere. And yeah. I, it's beginning to be a little more, but I will still create some time to respond to some of the questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll add the, those links uh, in the show notes and people can reach out. For the closing question, um, what excites you the most about the future of blockchain in Africa? Yes, um, I keep on, the, I write for, uh, I do columns for various newspapers. Um, we are almost getting to a level where we can also almost do a prescription using uh, blockchain and be able to, to, to create value out of aggregate. If you look at data, you would see the average African farmer is around 60. Um, it is worrying because in some countries, uh, the, the life expectancy is around 63. So at some point, you probably don't have a farmer in Africa. So what has happened is that you are beginning to see young people getting interested to invest in that space, which, which has so much returns, uh, which has so much opportunity, uh, but we did not understand it earlier, or we didn't know how to do distribution, uh, which is been made easier by technology.